Our dear Father in heaven, thank you. Your glory may shine upon us, and the fruits of our lips and the meditation of our hearts may be acceptable unto thee. We pray that um, your will may be accomplished in our lives, and Father, as we learn, that also we may have an opportunity to unlearn the things that we have believed which are not true. In Jesus' name, amen. And so a warm welcome to everyone viewing and listening to this. And uh, I'm glad that uh, we can join in together and be able to share in the word of God. And we are going through the series of um, uh, Minneapolis 1888, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, at this hour, we are looking at uh, the issue uh, uh, the aftermath of uh, Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath, the humanity of Jesus Christ, we covered it in the previous presentation. And the question now, why does it matter knowing the divine nature the, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ, the nature of Jesus Christ, both the divine nature and the human nature? Why does all these things matter unto us? Because uh, every doctrine that we present should be a doctrine that uh, it's not just uh, informative, but uh, it is uh, a reformative uh, doctrine. And so I just want to look at this issue. Why does this matter? What, why is the nature of Jesus Christ so important? And uh, why does it matter? And so uh, due to time, I'd like just to run through some things. And um, uh, just uh, the quote that we left with is where I'm starting with. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest is a holy ground. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of uh, Christ is a fruitful field, which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. And so we find that uh, uh, the reason why this uh, issue is so important is that uh, it, it is a golden link that binds us to Christ, and uh, it will reward the researcher. <clears throat> it is a minefield that those who approach it will be rewarded for doing that. And uh, what kind of reward are we talking about, uh, which is none other than uh, uh, the eternal life? There is no other reward that uh, we are studying, which is any but uh, uh, the reward of eternal life. So why is that the human nature of Christ? Some have wondered if uh, understood, uh, some have wondered, if understanding why Jesus came as a babe, as men and women come into the world, really matters. They say that a farm along the Nile in Egypt or a young man in Sudan or a young woman in college have greater things on their mind than getting it straight about Christ's humanity, as long as they know that Jesus died for them. Um, this is a uh, Herbert, uh, this is a uh, um, a fork in the road by Herbert Douglas, page eleven. And so he says that some have wondered if these things are so much important. But then this is uh, what we read in Desire of Ages, page 48, paragraph 5. Desire of Ages, page uh, 48, paragraph 5. The story of uh, Bethlehem is an exhaustless thing. In it, is, in it is hidden the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And you understand that in the book of Second Peter, chapter 1, we are told that um, grace and peace may be multiplied by the knowledge of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So when we enter into this study, what we know is that grace and peace is multiplied unto us. And in John 14, 27, we are told that peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth unto you, I give you my own peace. So the story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it, is, in it is hidden the depth of the riches, both of them, wisdom and uh, knowledge of God, Romans 11.33. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the championship of adoring angels for the beasts of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. 
yet this was but the beginning of his wonderful condensation. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take a man's nature, even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But uh, Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been awake, weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of uh, heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptation and to give us the example of a sinless life. So in studying this, we are not just curious um, in entering into the mysteries of God. We are not just curious about that, but uh, uh, we are entering into the realm that will help us to understand um, how we can overcome sin, how we can understand the plan of redemption, and how we can be a benefit to others as Christ also was also a benefit to humanity. So it is not um, a field that is ended upon with the main aim being the curiosity of knowing the secrets of God. It is um, a theme which is ended in, it is a field which is ended in for to, uh, to understand how best can I participate in the great controversy? How best can I participate in the great controversy? And that is the main, main, main object of studying this thing. Again, we read that um, in uh, 3SM 140 paragraph 2, the Lord Jesus came to a world not to reveal what God, a God could do, but what a man could do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. The Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam, through faith in Jesus Christ, serve him in the human nature which we now have. And so when we are exploring this, we are not exploring it so that um, we may see how uh, a God came on the earth to just um, reveal what a God can do. But we are studying this so that we may know how the, we can hold the hand of the omnipotent by power by looking at the nature of Jesus Christ and how humble he became and how he condescended to the level of humanity so that humanity may be able to study his life and his nature and be able to move closer to God. In Temperance 107 paragraph 1, the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that uh, because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Amen. The great grand work of bringing out a people who will have Christ-like characters and who will be able to stand in the day of the Lord is to be accomplished. And how is this accomplished? by holding the hand of Jesus Christ who was able to go through what we go through and he has left us an example by looking unto him he becomes the author and finisher of our eternal life that uh, there is no temptation that man is beset with which Christ was not tempted for we are told that he was tempted in every way as we are tempted and he overcame and his victory is our victory. He who seeks to transform humanity must himself understand humanity. And uh, this is the book, uh, Education, page uh, 78, that um, the, the study of the nature of Jesus Christ is to be able to understand his humanity so that uh, also we may be transformed. And the reason why he became human is so that um, he may understand the uh, infirmities of humanity and he may be able to succor them. Continued on, the only safety now is to search for the truth as revealed in the word of God as for hidden, oh, as for hid treasure. The subject of the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus. These are things that uh, should be our constant study. And um, we understand better the nature of man, not only by um, uh, 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 studying ourselves, but by studying the life of Jesus Christ. And uh, these are the great and important truths to be understood. This will prove us an anchor 
to hold God's people in this perilous time. And so the reason also we study the nature of Jesus Christ also that we may be we may be uh, able to have an anger to hold on when uh, every kind of wind of doctrine is blowing. The children of God need to stand in truth because we are sanctified by that truth and it is an anger. And we know that the Antichrist is about to do his marvelous work and the people of God must be acquainted with the truth so that they may not be beguiled by him. In uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 904-905, we read, The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden linked chain which binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. How does this humanity bind us to God? And we saw that through divinity, he holds the hand of divinity and through humanity, he holds the hands of humanity and he is that ladder that joins heaven to earth. That relationship that was broken needs a person with divinity to be able to atone for divine law and humanity to be an example for human beings who have been imperiled or who have been affected by sin for so many years. Christ was a real man and he gave proof of his humility in becoming a man and he was God in the flesh. When we approach the subject of, the, of Christ's divinity clothed with the garb of humanity, we may appropriately hear the words of, spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off the shoes from off the feet for the place where on thou standeth is holy, uh, holy ground. Again, we read, we must come to the subject, we must come to the study of this subject with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field, and will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden uh, truth. And so, let us look at uh, some Ahmed's history between 1852 to 1952s, uh, uh, and uh, uh, 1,200 statements of uh, the fallen human nation of Jesus Christ. But we shall not go through all these statements, but uh, just some things. And then we have 400 statements uh, of um, fallen human nature by E.G. White and 800 statements of uh, fallen uh, uh, human nature uh, through the pioneers' writing. So we have 800 by pioneer writings and 400 by E.G. White, and they make up 1,200 statements. Satan had made charges against God. Satan had made charges uh, against God. And so when we study the nature of Jesus Christ and how he humbled himself, it will help us even answer the charges of Satan. It will help us to answer the charges of Satan. And we know that one of the charges is that uh, uh, man cannot keep the law of God. Now, in uh, <clears throat> Christ's object lesson, page 314, and uh, faith uh, he lived by, page 114, uh, we are told God was unfair. Satan charged God with unfairness. God was unfair to make laws that created beings could not keep. So this was one of uh, the accusations that he had against God. In 1 SM 341, the other accusation was God demanded self-denial and sacrifice from his created beings, but uh, will not himself exercise such unselfishness toward his created beings. So these are the some of the charges, and the, these are the two most important charges that um, we can look at at the moment. Again, number three, God was severe, exacting, and harsh. That is steps to Christ, page 11 and 5T, 7, 38. Number four, God was the author of sin and suffering and death. Desire of Ages 24. Another child that the devil had against God, if God were fair and good, he would never have permitted created beings to transgress his law. Patriarchs and Prophets 131, 132. And then number six, God made faulty laws and that for the good of the universe, those laws should be changed. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 69. Uh, now, that I may know him, uh, page 18, paragraph 3, this is what we read. When man sinned, all heaven was filled with sorrow. Out of harmony with the nature of God, and yielding to the claims of his law, not by destruction was before the man, 
before the human race. Since the divine law is a change, as changeless as the character of God, there could be no hope for man unless some way could be devised whereby his transgression might be pardoned, his nature renewed, and uh, his spirit restored to reflect the image of God. Divine love had conceived such a plan. In uh, page 18, paragraph 4, and quoting John 3, 16, God's love. In the work of creation, Christ was with God. He was one with God, equal with him. He alone, the creator of man, could be his savior. No angel of heaven could reveal the father to the sinner and win him back to allegiance to God. But Christ could manifest the father's love. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto him. And uh, <clears throat> there is a way that uh, the father was in the son that he is never in the other people. And this is why, what I mean, that Christ was a real son a real begotten son of God, and he had a nature of God which could satisfy the demands of the law. Angels did not have the nature of God. Although they are divine, they are creatures. Christ was begotten, and that's something that stands out. And so the one who was equal with God, for God to show his unselfishness and to honor the charges of Satan, of Satan he has to send him down here with the nature of man, and to demonstrate that man can be able to keep the law of God and the charges of Satan against his government were unwarranted. But Christ could manifest the Father's love for God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Say the angel, think that the Father yielded up his dearly, the beloved Son, without struggle? No, no, it was even a struggle with the God of heaven, whether to let guilty man perish or to give his darling son to die for them. Angels were so interested for man's salvation that there could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for perishing man. But again, as you understand, Satan could have repeated, you see, he has taken another creature which is not related to him only they are related by creation and not by um, in quotes blood or by quotes nature that uh, he can give up for the salvation of man and all he can do is give those created beings that he doesn't have uh, any business with. And so God could not allow the angel to come here to save man, but he had to send his own dear son in the likeness of the sinful man so that um, he may demonstrate that he is unselfish and uh, he could not deny man anything. In fact, uh, I'm reminded of a statement in TM, a statement in TM, uh, which is uh, much important. Why God had to give out um, uh, his son, uh, the TM 518, I'll try and see. 518.2, TM 518.2, why the love of God is unsurpassed by anything else that we can think of. In uh, <clears throat> TM 518.2, I rejoice in the bright prospects of the future, and so may you. Be cheerful and praise the Lord for his loving kindness. That which you cannot understand, commit to him. He loves you and pities you every weakness it is your every weakness. He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It will not satisfy the heart of the infinite one to give those who love his son a lesser blessing than he gives his son. And so God decides to empty all heaven for the love that he had for the mankind. Although he had been charged with selfishness, he decides that I'll empty heaven of everything so that the creatures of my hand, the works of my hands may be saved. And that is why uh, uh, he gives out his son and he doesn't give him in another nature so that the son may be advantageous to the human beings, but he gives him in our nature, in incarnation, so that we may understand that the father will do everything to demonstrate that um, his love is uh, 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 unfailing and he is not... Uh, selfish. So um, again uh, in uh, 
we are told that uh, the plan of redemption but the plan of redemption had uh, yet a broad and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. And this is Patriarchs and Prophet, page um, 68. Again, how will, how will the charge against God be answered? How will the charge against God be answered? Christ came to represent the Father. We behold in him the image of the invisible God. He clothed his divinity with humanity and came to the world that the erroneous idea Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. Signs of the time, January 20, 1890, paragraph 5. And again in... Uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 216. This is what we read. Christ came to give to the world an example of what perfect humanity might be when united with divinity. He presented to the world a new face of greatness in his exhibition of mercy, compassion, and love. He gave to men a new interpretation of God. You see, men had a wrong idea of who God is. And Satan had imbibed his errors in the minds of men, which had been guided by a carnal heart. And now the heart needed to be renewed. And what does God do? He gives his son in our nature so that he may be able to uh, give men uh, a new interpretation of who God is. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep God's law. And he pointed to the disobedience of Adam as proving the declaration true. Signs of the time, April 10, 1993, and also found in truth about angels, page 58, paragraph 3. And so, Satan had made the boast that he would gather the world under his banner of rebellion. He declared that man could not keep the law of God. Christ came to prove the assertion for And uh, he and, and, and this will be repeated over and over so that we may understand that um, the real reason for studying the nature of Jesus Christ so that we may understand the kind of love the Father decided to demonstrate through the Son by giving him the nature of man to overcome sin so that it may be a stepping ladder, it may be a propelling uh, anchor point, it may be uh, uh, it may be uh, what I may call uh, uh, a stimulant, uh, an impetus for his victory over uh, of man victor over sin. In 18 MR 133.3, Christ's words, Satan has declared that man cannot keep the law. I'll show that his statement is false, that man can keep uh, the law. And so we are ever to be thankful that Jesus has proved to us by actual life that man can keep the commandments of God, contradicting Satan's falsehood that man cannot keep them. Signs of the Time, April 17, 1893, paragraph 3. Again, in Signs of the Time, January 16, 1896, paragraph 2, Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God and thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they could not keep the law, then there was fault with the lawgiver. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God in asserting that men cannot keep the law of God. But look at Jesus Christ. And then if you can say that man cannot uh, keep the law of God, then you are repeating the same sentiments of Satan that man cannot keep the law of God, which is untrue. And so if Christ could have not come in our nature, then the assertions of, of, of Satan could have been true that really man cannot keep the law of God. And so, Bible Echo, December 1, 1893, paragraph 4, Jesus humbled himself, clothing his divinity with humanity, in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family, and by both precept and example, condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. Again, divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined, and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of our fallen race.
now we have a golden link that touches heaven and touches earth so that uh, as it touches heaven, it atones for our sin. As it touches the earth, it gives us an example and the strength to be able to continue our daily life in a victorious way. In a 3SM, that is Selected Messages, book 3, page 134, paragraph 2, found also in letter 81, 1896, uh, a fallen nature, a fallen human nature connected with Christ's divinity. Though he had no taint of sin upon his character, yet he condescended to connect our fallen human nature with his divinity. By thus taking humanity, he honored humanity. Having taken our fallen nature, he showed what it might become by accepting the humble provision he has made for it and by becoming a partaker of the divine nature. And um, um, this is so beautiful because in the book of Genesis chapter 1, in uh, in the creation story, we are told that every tree had to yield um, uh, itself of, uh, of its own kind. Every tree has to yield of itself of uh, its own kind. And so um, when we look at Jesus Christ, we find that uh, he doesn't expect us to be what he is not. And so... Um, if he overcame sin, he doesn't expect us, if we are his sons and daughters, to be overcome by sin. And, uh, you know, he could only interact with God if he was in the nature of God and could only interact with man when he was in the nature of man. And so these two combined, one could hold upon divinity and another could hold upon humanity because if Christ could have come with divinity, then he could not have been our own kind. And then we could have not been requested to reproduce of the same kind because he was of another kind and he would want us to produce that which is not of our kind and that could have gone against the Genesis creation story. And so Christ has the two natures, the nature of God so that he may be able to interact with God and the nature of man so that he may be able in, to interact with man because uh, um, uh, in, in the book of Leviticus, in the, in, the, in the law of the kinsman redeemer, we are told that uh, if uh, uh, a stranger sojourneth in your midst and one of you is sold unto him, then his brother, his uncle could be able to redeem him. And so only one of their kinstock could be able to redeem that one which had been are uh, uh, sold to a stranger. And so Christ could not come with another nature to redeem us because if he came with another nature, then he could not be a kinsman redeemer to us. And so also he could not unite us with heaven because heaven, and which is occupied by the Father, and the angels have another nature, which is a divine nature. And so if he doesn't have the divine nature, then he cannot interact with them because every group has to stay with its own kind and to reproduce of their kind. And so it behooves Christ to have the divine nature so as he may be part of the family of heaven uh, or the family of divinity. And then he must have humanity to become part of the human race and then be a kinsman redeemer. And so... Uh, uh, it is for our sake. And we think that uh, it is enjoyable for Christ to incarnate. It was enjoyable for Christ to incarnate and have the two natures. I want you to think again. In his incarnation, he had the two natures. Inseparably one, but each in ten, it is distinct individuality. And none could interfere with the other. If any could interfere with the other, then it could have been against the law of the kinsman redeemer and the law of each kind produce, producing of its own kind. Let me just uh, try to simplify this. If Christ in his human nature, he could have been aided with the divine nature, then he would not have been actually uh, 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 showing a perfection, uh, uh, um, showing an uh, example to humanity that they can overcome in humanity. If he had used his own divine nature, 
then he could have been advantageous and not showing an example to his own kind. And if the human nature could have tended the divine nature, then it could have imperiled heaven, the position of Christ in heaven, which means that the divine nature could have been polluted by sin. And so each has to, say, to exist in its own individuality and not interfere with the other. And yet, when Christ, when he is tempted, if um, he could decide to use his divine nature, then he could uh, destroy the enemy like that, or um, what uh, I may say that he could have interfered with their humanity. And so he had to be a human being and rely on his father to give the strength so that every child of Adam may become a child of second Adam by depending on the father of the second Adam. Otherwise, uh, uh, this is a field that is a mind a minefield, and we are told that uh, everyone who studies it will be rewarded. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. And there we have the uh, divinity combined with humanity, and dwelt among us as we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so, uh, um, we find that Christ is uh, has divinity, and uh, there is no imperfection in divinity, and so uh, he is divine. He is in the fullness of the Godhead. He is in the fullness of the Godhead. That is what we are told, the two natures of Jesus Christ. And uh, Christ is a real human being. A human body was his. A human mind was his. His humanity was created. It did not have angelic power, so he was a real man. And uh, in his divine nature, he was immortal and cannot die. But in his human nature, he was mortal and died at Calvary because uh, divinity was subjected to humanity. And uh, when divinity is subjected to humanity, then death can be uh, uh, possible. Uh, so in incarnation, Jesus Christ was subjected to humanity. The divinity was subjected to humanity, although uh, he was, while he remained faithful, the God way, Godhead was his. And so Christ could not be anything less than divinity because that divinity is the price or the uh, is the uh, is the price of redemption or it is what is what paid for our redemption. Any imperfection in divinity, any less God could not pay for our sin because um um, uh, the law of God is divine and it represents the character of God. It is not less perfect. The character of God is not less perfect. And so there is no less, uh, 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 there is no, nothing like a lesser God. He was in the fullness of the Godhead. And uh, uh, this is what actually he laid down his life. He laid down his immortal life so that he can die on Calvary, and uh, when he laid down, he committed that, that life to the Father, then there was the sundering of the divine powers, and then the price of uh, uh, our, sins, uh, uh, our sins was paid. As a member of the human family, he was mortal, but as God, he was found in life to the world. He could, in his divine person, ever have withstood the advantage of death and refused to come under its dominion. But he voluntarily laid down his life, that in so doing, he might give life and bring mortality to light. What humility was this? It amazed angels. The tongue can never describe it. The imagination cannot take um, it in. The eternal word consented to be made flesh. God became man. Revealed Herald, Herald, July 5, 1887. And so, uh, in his divinity, he had this sinless nature. And uh, in his humanity, he had fallen, sinful nature. And the two natures really uh, uh, existed in their own individuality. He took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that attempted medical ministry, page 181. In his sinful nature, that is my scripture, uh, Releases, volume 17, page uh, 26, carnal, sinful, fallen flesh, this love was manifested, but it cannot be comprehended by mortal man. It is a mystery too deep for the human mind 
to fathom. Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature because by this act of condemnation he would be enabled to pour out his blood in behalf of the fallen race. And when you read uh, the book of uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, he said that he poured out his soul. Now his soul was a sinless nature. He could not pour out a sinful nature for atoning sin. For the atoning of the sin in Isaiah 53, he poured out his soul, which was a sinless nature. And that is the pain of the redemption. And uh, as an example, he uh, uh, bore our sinful fallen flesh. And so Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature. The two actually were blended into, uh, uh, into were inseparably one. And so this love was manifested, but it cannot be comprehended by mortal man. It is a mystery too deep for the human mind to fathom. Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature. Because by this act of condemnation, he would be enabled to pour out his blood in behalf of the fallen race. Again, a right conception of sin. And so, um, um, we are told that uh, sin as a doctrine of the Christian system is the common denominator of the other doctrines. The doctrines relating to sin forms that send around which we build our entire theological system. If our conception of sin is faulty, our whole superstructure all of beliefs will be one error built on another, each one more absurd than the last, yet each one necessary if it is to fit in consistently with the whole erroneous scheme. If we are to end right, we must begin right. Many, perhaps most of the errors which have protruded themselves into Christian theology can be finally traced to a faulty conception of sin and even not the right uh, understanding of the nature of Christ. The reason for my false promise is to start an endless chain of false conclusions. And so uh, uh, there, there are things that we have to look at and uh, the false doctrine of original sin states that to sin is not a choice. We are born sinners. We will always be sinners. Practically displayed in false philosophy of health, disease is caused by faulty genetics. Lifestyle doesn't matter because we have no choice in this matter. Example, someone defending a transgression of the natural law. We are going to die anyway. I might as well enjoy myself a little while I am uh, here. And so uh, that is seen as nature. And fallen nature, um, number two, is that um, the false doctrine of the unfallen nature of Christ states that Christ did not need to overcome sin in the way we do. Therefore, we do not need to overcome. It was easier for him to not commit sin than for us. Practically displayed in a false philosophy of health, it is perfectly acceptable not to live a healthy life in all aspects because we are not required to be perfect. Example, a little wine here or there, a few puffs of cigar smoke, a little pepperoni on my pizza, even though I know it is bad of my health, it's not going to make me lose my salvation. God knows my heart, I am good. So, it exempts fallen man from having victory over sin when you give a false promise that Christ had unfallen nature. Continued on, um, no perfection. This is what it will produce, number three. The false doctrine of the imperfectibility of Christian character states that we will never be perfect, striving to daily obtain perfection of character and victory over besetting sins through Christ is tantamount to salvation by uh, works and so practically displayed in a false philosophy of health we can keep making unhealthy lifestyle choices because we don't need to be perfect so if um, you have a wrong nature of Jesus Christ you will give him an unfallen nature and if you give him unfallen nature what you will end up in is no perfection is required because if Christ was not in our nature how can he uh, expect of us in our nature to be perfect again Another problem, uh, you will have a problem with the sanctuary and then end up with no health reform. And so uh, 
Number four, the full doctrine of salvation by justification alone so that we are saved and made righteous once and for all. We can then return to our sins because we are no longer under the law. Practically displayed is a false philosophy of health. All we need to do is ask to be healed and we can get a pill, a high-tech treatment, a knee replacement, etc. We can then continue living the unhealthy lifestyle that nine times out of ten resulted in our illness. Example, uh, primary tobacco-related lung disease patients stating, I need a breathing treatment so I can go take a small break. And so, uh, sin as a choice, what does it uh, 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 bring unto us. It will give us a fallen nature of Jesus Christ and then a perfection which is possible and then a heavenly sanctuary which is to give us the strength and atonement and it will lead us to rightful principles of living. To reason from a false premise is to start an endless chain of false conclusion. And so if we are to end right, we must begin right. And to begin right, we must grapple with the question of sin in it is doctrinal significant. Then we may proceed to build a system of theology with confidence, knowing that our constitutions will be based on correct uh, premises. And uh, this is what we say, that um, uh, uh, a right understanding of the issues at stake, a right understanding of the nature of Jesus Christ will lead us to a right understanding of how to deal with sin. If we have a wrong understanding of the nature of Jesus Christ, then we will have conclusions which are wrong. We, should, we will not have a right understanding of uh, what is expected of us because, uh, you know, what was expected of Jesus Christ is what is expected from us. But if Christ was exempted from what we are, then what was expected from Jesus Christ is not what is expected from us. You find the logic? And so if you give him another nature which we do not have, then God expects something else from Jesus Christ and expects something else from us. And then if that is the case, then Christ who is the link, the golden link which binds humanity with divinity, will have a disconnection. Because God expected from him something else and he expects us from us something else. Now, Christ, who is to be the golden link, has never experienced what we experience. And so he cannot bring us to a condition where we are united with Father. He cannot succor us because he don't understand us because he was not in our nature. And so a wrong understanding of the nature of Jesus Christ will lead us to a wrong understanding of how to deal with sin and will lead us into erroneous conclusion. And by the way, it will um, widen the gap between man and God and not have a golden link that uh, unites divinity with humanity. And so how I pray that uh, we shall continue exploring the things that uh, we read and uh, we study. And God who uh, understands better then uh, we uh, can be able to lead us into perfect righteousness and can be able to lead us into all truth. Otherwise, um, I, I invite us to continue studying together the implications of uh, 1888, what God is uh, desiring to do in his church once again, and to bring it into a point that uh, it can be able to sound uh, the loud cry of the fourth angel. When the angel comes down with power and glory, we want to be ready to participate in it. But we cannot participate in this glory if uh, we are appropriating uh, a false view of Christ who is, uh, and so uh, exempting us to share in his, uh, or him to share in our nature and uh, become victorious and give us the same victory that is needed of us. And so may the Lord bless us and uh, as Bereans, continue searching for the truth, and the truth will set you free. I know that uh, God is willing to make us whole again and uh, to unite us as one, not only in doctrines, but in spirit, in faith, so that uh, we may press uh, the forefront together and be able to end uh, 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 the miseries that uh, is plunging this earth uh, or plaguing this earth. And so God bless us, and uh, shall we finish uh, with a word of prayer. Our dear Father, once again, thank you for your grace and thank you for the good weather. 
And thank you for the word of inspiration. We pray that uh, our minds may be able to comprehend the divine things, that uh, Christ um, may be the, that ladder that we shall continue uh, climbing heaven uh, through. And above all, Lord, that we may be brought into union with you, that grace and peace may be multiplied as we have a knowledge of thee and thy son. And so, bless your children. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, bye for now. Until next, when we shall be looking at uh, the sin problem, its definition, and uh, how it can be uh, handled. Bye for now.